Raleigh, North Carolina, 3 a.m. Monique and Paul Berkeley are taking a romantic stroll in Millbrook Exchange Park to round off a night out, when suddenly... The gunman was hiding in the bushes. He jumped out and started firing. Another man was with him. They grabbed Paul's wallet and they took off. Monique Berkeley calls 911. She is so incoherent, it takes a 911 operator three minutes to realize her husband Paul is there, and he's been shot too. Paul Berkeley is a Navy reservist and is back on leave, having been deployed to Bahrain in the Middle East a year earlier. Michelle reveals the couple had been out for dinner and a movie and had decided to take a late night stroll in the park when they were attacked. Police officers rush to the scene and find Monique bent over Paul's body. She's been hit in the shoulder, but Paul's much worse. Paul's been shot in the back of the head. They rush him to a nearby hospital. Paul Berkeley clings to life for just a few hours, then dies. He was 46 years old. Monique Berkeley is also rushed to the hospital. Her shoulder wound is not life-threatening. Investigators jump onto this case pretty quickly, hoping to move fast enough to catch the killers. And the first thing they want to know is pretty simple. Why were Paul and Monique in the park that late? Monique explains that husband's been away, stationed in the Middle East for almost a year. This was sort of a date night, and they felt amorous, so they headed to the park. The Berkeleys have been married five years. The two met in California when he was a computer specialist and she was an honor student, just barely out of high school. It was his third marriage, and Monique was 20 years younger than Paul. She's not much older than his two teenage kids from his first marriage. But the couple seemed in love. She really took to the role of being a stepmom. They settled in Clayton, a tranquil suburb of Raleigh, and a safe place, they thought, to raise children. When Paul shipped out with his Naval Reserve detachment, that left Monique to raise the kids on her own. Monique and the Berkeley kids each kept their own online blogs, and their posts tell of typical suburban life. The blogs talk about Monique and her stepdaughter shopping for hot new swimsuits, washing the car, or watching her stepson perform in his punk rock band. Paul Berkeley also kept a blog. In it, he writes how good it felt to be home and how proud he was to see his son perform with the high school chorus. They sang the national anthem and dedicated the concert to Paul. His final entry was posted just hours before his death. He talked about eating pizza and watching movies with his daughter, and then showing a training program for soldiers called Shoot, Don't Shoot. The test describes different situations, asking soldiers if they'll shoot a person or not. It was almost eerie. Just hours later, Paul was shot dead in a situation that that training program could never have predicted. Back in the park, Raleigh police combed the crime scene for clues. If the assailants had been in the area long, they might have left behind cigarette butts or personal items, water bottles. No clue is too small. But a sweep of the area turns up nothing useful, except for several shell casings, which came from the shooter's gun. There he was, risking his life overseas, only to come home for some much-deserved R&R, and he gets shot there. Police are determined to catch Paul Berkeley's killer, and within hours of the shooting, odd facts in the case start coming to light, raising investigators' suspicions. They start interviewing neighbors and friends, asking about the four members of the Berkeley household. And neighbors say, well, actually, there's a fifth person who lives there. It seems the family had taken in a sort of unofficial house guest. As police learn more of this unusual arrangement, it becomes clear that something strange was going on at the Berkeley home. A few months after Paul went overseas, another man moved in. 18-year-old Andrew Canty was friends with Paul's son. The two went to high school together. Neighbors say that Canty and Monique seemed to be very close. Very, very close. Even Monique's blog entries seem to make oblique references to the racy goings on at home. They weren't terribly discreet about it. One neighbor said that when Paul moved out, this canty fellow moved in. He just assumed the Berkeleys had separated. 
but the Berkeleys were still very much married, just separated by thousands of miles. A late night encounter with two unknown assailants leaves Navy reservist Paul Berkeley shot dead and his wife Monique recovering from a gunshot wound to the shoulder. Monique should have been considered a victim, but the more police heard about her affair, the more she seemed like a suspect. So this young man, Andrew Canty, has sort of unofficially moved into the house, but he's not the only guy hanging around. Soon, Canty's buddy, Latuan Johnson, another 18-year-old, is also seen frequently at the Berkeley house. He starts dating Paul's 16-year-old daughter. That relationship lasts several weeks till Latuan goes off to college. It's doubtful Paul was aware of any of this, at least not while overseas. He posted in his own blog that he was pretty jazzed to be going home. Andrew Canty's mother learned of the affair earlier that year. He told his mother and eventually moved in. She wasn't happy, but he was 18 and could legally do what he wanted. Canty moved back home when Paul Berkeley returned to the States. For investigators, the mystery of Paul's death is seeming less and less mysterious. The coincidences are just too great. Police were looking for two assailants, and now you've got two young men who've been hanging around at the Berkeley house while Paul was away. Police soon discover that at some point after he had returned home, Paul learned the truth about his wife. He told his daughter he suspected Monique was having an affair, and he was prepared to divorce her. Investigators also learn that Paul had a life insurance policy. In the event of his death, Monique would receive $400,000. Now that motive is pretty sweet. Detectives discover Canty had recently bought a gun, and he testified at a yard in nearby Johnston County. Police scour the area and turn up shell casings, and they match those found at the crime scene. Monique Berkeley, Andrew Canty, and Latuan Johnson are each arrested and charged with first-degree murder. On December 23, 2005, less than a week after the shooting, Monique confesses to the crime. Fearing Paul was going to divorce her, she got together with Canty and Johnson and decided to bump Paul off and then split the insurance money. When Monique and Paul were at the movies that night, she slipped away to the restroom and called Canty, telling him where they would be heading. Johnson drives Canty to the park, where Monique has lured her husband with a promise of sex. In the darkness, Canty walks past the couple, but not for long. He shoots Monique, giving her a minor flesh wound, and takes Paul's wallet to make it look like a robbery. Though police never find the murder weapon, the prosecution has a strong case. To avoid possible execution, Monique Berkeley and Andrew Canty each plead guilty to first-degree murder and are sentenced to life in prison without parole. Latuan Johnson pleads guilty to second-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder in the first degree. He is sentenced to 23 years in prison. There was a comment posted on Monique's blog that said it best. It read, laying around in young men's arms while your husband endures the horrible heat and conditions overseas it's disgusting. Two cases, one from West Virginia, the other North Carolina. Two unfaithful wives consumed by passion, driven by greed. These women flaunted their infidelity out in the open, and now they're behind bars. And it seems that there's some justice in that. A dangerous pattern of desire, deceit, and destruction on Justice Served, Murderous Affairs. Today, the stories of two murder cases, one in Morgantown, West Virginia, the other in Raleigh, North Carolina. In our first case, a cheerleader coach scores major points with a football coach. They were hot for each other and determined to start a new life together. But their dreams go up in smoke, leaving behind a mystery. Why would you stay in bed when the whole house is in flames around you? In our second case, 
a romantic stroll in the park, or a sailor home on leave turns to terror. Is this some random robbery attempt, or have they just walked into a deadly trap? Would justice be served for these crimes? Two cases of love gone wrong coming up now on Justice Served, Murderous Affairs. Morgantown, West Virginia, 10.30 a.m. Police and fire crews race to the home of Jimmy and Michelle Michael, where a fire is raging out of control. It's quite a blaze, with flames shooting through the roof. The alarm was raised by Robert Teets. He's an employee and a friend of Jimmy's. As firemen try to bring the blaze under control, they search the house for anyone trapped inside. Jimmy and his wife, Michelle, have four kids. But the kids are in school, and Robert called Michelle, verifying she was at work at the nearby hospital. That just leaves Jimmy unaccounted for. Firefighters check the garage, find his car inside. He's not responding to his cell phone. It, it just doesn't look good. The fire is eventually brought under control and put out. In the master bedroom are the charred remains of Jimmy Michael. It looked like he hadn't even moved to try to escape, apparently overcome by smoke when he was still sleeping. Now homeless, Michelle Michael is receiving condolences at her neighbors, where she's surrounded by distraught family and friends. This is a small town. News travels fast, and people were devastated. Jimmy was well liked. Jimmy and Michelle had married around five years earlier. The two met when they both worked at a local hospital in town. She was a nurse in the pediatric intensive care unit, and he was a respiratory therapist. Michelle was energetic, kind of flirty. She was a former college cheerleader. By all accounts, when she met Jimmy, it was like a moth to a flame. They were both married at the time, and each had two kids. They began an affair, later divorcing their spouses so they could be together full time. It was a tumultuous start, but the match seemed a good one. He coached Pee Wee football on weekends. She coached the cheerleaders. Jimmy eventually started his own business and they moved into a nice house. But now that house has been destroyed and investigators have questions. You definitely consider this a suspicious fire. Why was Jimmy still home when he should have been at work? Why didn't he try to make a run for it? And why did the fire move so fast? That same evening, a Morgantown police detective meets with Jimmy's widow, Michelle. Michelle says she left the house at 6 a.m. Jimmy had played basketball the night before and needed to sleep some more. So she kissed him on the cheek and headed to a shift at the hospital. Michelle says she'd ironed clothes in the bedroom that morning, but can't recall if she left it unplugged. She was buried together, no emotion. The detectives thought it was odd, given that her husband had just faced a horrific death. Still, she's a nurse in the ICU. She's used to remaining calm under pressure, and perhaps the shock of what happened hasn't really taken effect. Michelle states she was at work the entire morning, except for one moment. Around 8 a.m., she realized she'd left a pager in a car and ran out to the parking lot to get it. Otherwise, she was in the ICU. The following morning, a detective, as a matter of course, checks the hospital's security cameras and sees Michelle running out to her car at 8.11. But then she drives off, not returning until 8.28. Police, obviously, are now suspicious. I mean, why did she lie? And where did she go? Suspicion grows more intense when the medical examiner in Charleston, West Virginia, releases his preliminary report. He found no soot in the respiratory tract. Jimmy didn't breathe in any smoke, which means he was dead before the fire started. To determine the cause of death, the medical examiner sends out blood samples for a series of toxicology tests. So did Jimmy have a heart attack or was he murdered? And if so, how and why? News of his death stuns the small town community and prompts an unexpected phone call. Authorities get an anonymous tip advising them to check Jimmy's blood 
for a certain drug, a paralyzing agent typically found in hospitals and the ICU. Detectives decide to pay another visit to the grieving widow. She's now at a hotel surrounded by various friends and neighbors, including Robert Teets, the guy who reported the fire. Robert and Michelle were kind of sprawled out on the bed. He's got his arms around her, and he's, he's kind of comforting her. Comfort is one thing, but this guy's married. She's just been widowed. The whole thing seemed not quite right. Detectives interview various friends and relatives of the victim, hoping to learn more about his life and marriage. There were rumors that Jimmy and Michelle had been having marital problems. Detectives learned that two years earlier, Jimmy had received a startling note in the mail. The note read, keep your wife away from my husband. Now, rumors were circulating about Michelle and Robert Teets. The two had recently gone on a business trip to Chicago together and were seen snuggling and getting close. Investigators check the hotel and find, sure enough, they've booked one room for that trip with one king-size bed. That trip was less than two weeks before the fire and Jimmy Michael's death. Police now have two major suspects and too many unanswered questions. Did Jimmy's wife somehow kill him? Or was it her lover? Or could it have been someone else entirely? In sleepy Morgantown, West Virginia, a seemingly picture-perfect marriage is ripped apart when businessman Jimmy Michael dies mysteriously before his home erupted in flames. But a love affair is a far cry from proving murder until two major pieces of the puzzle fall into place. Police discovered that Jimmy and Michelle Michaels had recently purchased life insurance policies. Michelle was due to receive $500,000 from Jimmy's death. So that's motive. And then there's opportunity. A neighbor tells police he saw a car pulling out of the Michaels driveway at around 8.20 that morning, and he's certain it was Michelle's vehicle. That's a major break in the case. That puts her on the scene right in the middle of that window when she'd left work for no apparent reason. Still unsure as to her lover's involvement, police confront Robert Teets about the affair and his whereabouts on the day of the crime. He admits to the affair. It started, he said, on that business trip they'd taken to Chicago about two weeks earlier. But as for where he was throughout the morning of the fire, his alibi seems airtight. He's seen at the office early that morning, and then he delivers some medical equipment to a client. He's accounted for right up until he called in the fire. And the arson investigators know the fire had been burning for some time before his call. That leaves Michelle Michael, who stymies the police. She just denies everything. She denies having an affair and denies leaving the hospital grounds on the day of the murder. Hospital security footage shows her driving off a little after 8 that morning. Michelle eventually does concede that, yes, she did drive off, but it was just to run an errand. She didn't go home. She'd only lied about it earlier to the police because she didn't want to get in trouble with her boss. Investigators don't buy her excuses. She remains their prime suspect. Detectives and agents with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms examine the crime scene for clues. They determined that the fire started near the foot of the bed and that some sort of accelerant was used. A few weeks later, the toxicology results are in, and things look worse for Michelle Michael. The tests come back positive for rocuronium, a drug used in hospitals to paralyze throat muscles when patients need a breathing tube inserted. If a patient's injected and left unattended, they'll suffocate. It really is a terrifying way to die. The drug matches the anonymous tip police received a few days after the crime. And like the anonymous tipster suggested, the drug is readily available at the hospital where Michelle works. Now, investigators can show means, motive, and opportunity. With that, the prosecution can make its case. Four months after the fire, on March 30th, 2006, Morgantown police arrest Michelle Michael and charge her with murder in the first degree and arson. 
because of rampant publicity about the case in and around Morgantown, the Charlies moved more than 150 miles away to the state capital of Charleston. There in the county courthouse, prosecutors face a difficult task. The prosecution has lots of evidence against Michelle, but a lot of it is circumstantial. The state's theory is that she swiped a vial of this paralyzing drug and injected her husband while he was asleep. Prosecutors can prove the drug was readily available at the hospital where she worked, but they have no evidence proving that Michelle took it or that any of the drug went missing. The time frame is also tight. She's seen leaving the hospital at 8.11 and returning at 8.28. That gives her 17 minutes to drive home, light a fire, and drive back. Michelle takes the stand in her own defense and vigorously proclaims her innocence. The jury doesn't buy it. After a day and a half of deliberations, they return with the verdict, guilty on both counts. The judge sentences her to life with the possibility for parole in 20 years. In sentencing her, the judge calls her actions cold. Somehow, he said, there's a very dark side to your character. 